there is no going back to the person that I was before I did the dam. This was unlike any mission we'd been taught about in Ranger history. We sent 100 guys and they had like a battalion, so we were outnumbered. My chief fear was, am I gonna have the guts to go forward? Am I gonna have that, that courage? I was a 19-year-old private, what I was truly getting myself into, I had no clue. My name is Matthew Sanders. I'm 32 and from Kansas City, Missouri. When 9-11 happened, I was 18. I woke up that Tuesday. It's on the news. I'm listening to it on the radio. I get downtown, and City Hall is blocked off, like, for blocks. Once I saw, you know, that Kansas City, Missouri, you know, was on lockdown, it literally hit home, you know, and it was like, I, I knew, like, everything was about to change. And so on 9-11, I was there at the recruiting station. At that point, they told me that there was a possibility I was going to become a medic, which not something I signed up for. So I didn't really know what to make of it. He was um, voluntold by his squad that he was going to learn how to be an EMT. Doc Buma is the company senior medic who trained me as a 11 Bravo medic. He was my mentor. Um, he was my, my big brother. I was a new private, and he taught me a lot about, you know, life as a ranger. Rangers are the, the you know, primary elite fighting force. It's almost like you, t you hear about valedictorians go to Harvard and everybody's valedictorian, you know. You go to the Ranger Regiment, everybody's the, the baddest guy on the block. At the time, I had already gone through two tours and uh, Matt was the only cherry private I ever had. As a medic, you don't deal with privates. I usually get guys that are come trained. Uh, a cherry private is a private who's uninitiated to combat and cherry is a... Uh... It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, Jesus. <laughs> In the world of the Ranger Regiment, a cherry private is somebody who hasn't done anything yet, who hasn't proven themselves yet. In this new role as 11 Bravo Medic, my fear was, you know, if someone gets hurt, you know, am I gonna be able to, to help them? I didn't, I didn't tell anybody that I was afraid, because I didn't want them to have any doubt in me. So I just, I kind of tucked it away. And, you know, I, I told myself that, you know, no matter what, I was going to give everything that I could. Iraq continues to have and develop weapons of mass destruction. The White House wants a vote at the Security Council Thursday. What we have done thus far has not been sufficiently persuasive. No one had told us we were going to Iraq, but we all kind of knew. You know, if you were watching CNN or Fox News in 2003, you know, you knew that we're about to go to war. Above all, you know, I think I was more curious, you know, like, what's it going to be like? You know, what, what's, what's, what's war going to feel like? What's it going to be like to jump into Iraq? We did a tactical air land at cruise altitude. They turned off the engines. And then they just kind of do this like tactical descent where it's, it's like a roller coaster ride. And they turn the engines on at the last moment. I remember kind of expecting to just kind of drive off and it'd be guns blazing, but we arrived to a little fanfare. The invasion and the pre-invasion of Iraq was a very surreal time. Originally, we were meant to invade uh, Baghdad International Airport in a, in a major raid. But the conventional forces were seizing these towns so quickly in the shock and awe campaign that uh, we lost our mission and it left uh, special operations leaders kind of scrambling to figure out what roles they could serve. Finally, we got this mission. They told us we were going to go hit Haditha Dam. 
The Haditha Dam was essentially a very important strategic point for the invasion of Iraq. It provided uh, one of the only main highways across the Euphrates. It provided hydroelectric power to the western half of Iraq. The initial fear was that um, the Iraqi army might sabotage the dam and actually flood the entire city of Haditha. This would be disastrous to the people there, but it would also be disastrous to the invasion. Basically, we were told there's this huge dam and we have to go secure it. The idea was that it would go very quite simply. And we would seize this hard point and then hold on to it for about 30 hours. And then uh, by then the conventional forces would relieve us. And so things just didn't quite go that way. There's just something in the air. We were all prepared to die prepared to go and do what we needed to do to further the ranger name and to protect whatever it is that we thought we were protecting at the time. We drove throughout the night. All this time, you know, you would see on the horizon bomb flashes from the shock and awe campaign. As you pull up to the dam, I remember seeing it for the first time, and it was just so huge. The structure itself was, I don't know how many stories, but it's in the double digits, I'm sure. Indeed, the dam was about two miles long, about 150 feet tall. When we pull up to the dam, my platoon was tasked with taking a series of buildings on the near side as we approached. We saw some members of the Iraqi army, which we zip tied and detained. And we're preparing to take the rest of the hydroelectric facility. You know, we were hoping we could do it quietly. I didn't even think about the fact that I was shooting until after I fired four or five rounds and, you know, we'd all, you know, stop shooting because the targets weren't standing any longer. It took probably a good 30 seconds to realize that we just shot somebody. It was one of those things that I always thought about it, you know, going in the infantry, engaging, you know, the enemy is something that you're supposed to, to look forward to, something I, I always wondered if I'd have the ability to do. And, you know, when it happened, it didn't feel like the way I thought it would feel. It, it, I didn't really feel anything. You know, it, it, it didn't feel real at the time. You know, it, it didn't feel any different than training. And, and then it just, you know, before I really had time to let it all sink in, the battle, you know, kind of just erupted. All of a sudden, these RPGs are flying up in the air and airbursting over us. We began doing gun runs overhead. I must have woke up the village and everybody knew that we were there. And this thing became the scariest mission that I'd ever been on in my life. entrenched themselves in the low ground, but they hadn't truly secured the high ground of the dam. And we were able to take the structure itself relatively easy. And it was a matter of, of us being, you know, in the high ground, pushing the enemy back from that point. We were taking fire from all directions. We sent 100 guys, and they had like a battalion, so we were outnumbered. They were shooting RPGs, 
it was crazy. I mean, there was a, a, a high volume of gunfire at this point. Things are blowing up around me. In the beginning of the battle, it was basically my job to take a high point of terrain by a bunker at the base of the dam, which we dubbed the Eagle's Nest. It was the highest point in the entire valley, and I could see everything going on, which meant I could relay valuable information to the unit. We had a full field of fire from their position. A full field of fire for a well-trained sniper essentially means that any enemy infantry that you can see, you can kill. I had conducted two deployments in Afghanistan before moving over to sniper section. Becoming a ranger had been something I'd been wanting to do since I was around 15. I bounced around most of my life all along the West Coast. Unlike a military brat, I was a hippie brat. But I think the, uh, the lifestyle is pretty similar. Some of my earliest memories were formed when I was three and my mother took me on the Great Peace March which was a march across the country in hopes of a nuclear disarmament. I suppose it's a little obvious and a little cliche that I'd become a sniper or army ranger, uh, having such a liberal upbringing. I don't know if I'll ever be able to put in context the mindset behind uh, men in sniper sections. About half of sniper section were these kinds of uh, stereotypical rangers these, uh, these were guys that on the weekends, they'd go out hunting. And you know, you'd, you'd go to see them for morning formation, they'd have a bled hog in the back of their pickup truck. And these guys are just like so country. And then the other half were guys like me, which were these like kind of more heady, more neurotic, and they make a good blend. I never showed hesitancy. I never was afraid. I was the type of guy that at the end of the day, they all knew, oh yeah, this guy will, he'll be a trigger puller. This idea of crawling through mud, you know, getting eyes on an objective and I identifying a target. I mean, this is all very sexy stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, having a suppressed rifle, I mean, it was all I ever really wanted. We fired so many rounds in the dam literally in a pile of brass and then like fired at live targets. We were essentially a sniper team sitting in a move at target range. It wasn't until all of the gunfire and everything started that you really started seeing the exposure to different types of casualties. My position was such that I was able to really watch the battle space unfold in front of me. At one point, one vehicle took a wrong turn, drove through Iraqis on both sides. And they had to turn around and drive right back through it. We watched that vehicle go through that ambush and then drive back through the kill zone. I knew that someone had gotten hit. I heard the call for medic. I remember Gunny turning to me and saying, Sanders, that's you. That was like being just let off the leash. My mind was going down everything I was supposed to do just kind of at once. I was expecting the worst. I was expecting to see, you know, an arterial bleed or a sucking chest wound. And then I get there and, you know, it's this foot injury kind of yelled out like, you've been shot, you know, like, just because I finally saw it. And he's kind of like, well, duh, you know, but it put a quick tr pressure dressing on it. He actually refused uh, any sort of pain medication, took it like a champ. It was a good introduction to, to being a, a medic, kind of, okay, I can do this. This is something that, you know, like, you're capable of doing this, you're trained, 
you're gonna be fine, you know, fear, no fear, like, you can do this. For the rest of the night, it was literally from one position to the next and just, you know, observing rangers in action. You'd see this, like, look like lightning strike. A couple seconds later, you'd feel the thunder, you know, but it, it wasn't lightning, it wasn't thunder. It was, you know, 2,000 pound bombs, you know, courtesy of the red, white, and blue. I was so fired up that there was no sleeping. Everything was so real. I remember even thinking, like, this does not feel like any movie I've ever seen in my entire life. We had our perimeter. Then we asked, well, what, what are we doing now? And so uh, they say, well, you know, we might end up being here a lot longer. We realized that we were going to be here for a while. And we also realized that we were, like, running out of food, water, you know, relatively quickly. You get to a point where you just say, I got to sleep at some point. You hear the rounds coming in, and you go, maybe, or maybe I'll survive, maybe I won't. I don't know. But if I wake up, then I'm going to fight another day. early in the morning, pre-dawn, and we were taking enemy fire from a mortar and trying to figure out where it was coming from. So we're scanning, and then we see there's a guy on a little island at the lake, and he's got a mortar tube, and he's alone, and he's launching mortars at us. And he's just out of range of anything that we really have. And so we're figuring out what to do, and then just out of nowhere, this, uh, the anti-tank team pulls a javelin system. Now, a javelin is an anti-vehicle weapon. They're meant to take out Soviet tanks. I see this rocket just shoot up as if we were trying to shoot down like a helicopter or something. I actually sh thought that like there was a helicopter in the sky somewhere. Everybody stopped fighting. We all stopped shooting. We all stopped shooting to watch this thing glide through the air, goes up, it goes up, it goes up, and then it just drops down. It looks like a Predator missile just blew up this entire island. I mean, it was absurd. It was um, quite crazy. We all felt better that we weren't taking mortars after that. I was initially at the top of the dam at the casualty collection point. As the medic, I wanted to be with my guys, and that's where I feel most comfortable. Despite the fact that we were getting a bunch of indirect fire and all this other stuff, my job was to be with them. At one point, I linked up with Doc Buma at the casualty collection point, and there was a, a wounded Iraqi who had been shot through the face. As a medic, you have to work on both sides. You know, it's not, it's very conflicting sometimes. From Doc and Buma, it was this just degree of humanity in, in a very inhumane situation. What I learned really early on was that most of us are scared of what we don't know. And so as long as I know what I'm getting into, I will have a better insight as to how I can beat that up particular obstacle. That's all I did was train, learn how to help people, learn how to take care of people. I joined when I was 17. I still had my senior year to do, but I knew that there was no money there for me to go to college. So that was just a guy trying to make a better life for myself. And uh, so I chose to be a medic because I thought that that would provide me um, a way to earn a career, earn a living when I got out of the military. My idea was like, if I'm gonna be a medic, I should be surrounded by the best guys possible, right? So I'll be a medic for them. And so that's what I decided to do, was to become a medic for the range regiment. My parents were very much like, live your dream, you know? They are very supportive. My dad is a very silent strength kind of guy, but I you know he struggled with everything.
In the Ranger Regiment, you don't get to talk to your family. You're gone for six months at a time. Nobody knows. They just follow CNN. They see the ticker on the bottom and they hear two Rangers died. They have no idea who it is. So my dad used to know where I was at in the sense that you know, of what was going on in the news. My dad was a prison guard. He used to uh, wear long johns every day in the summertime underneath his uniform. And, uh, and they'd say, well, why do you do that? And he says, well, my son's, um, my son is, is hot right now, so I don't want him to be hot while alone. So that's the type of dad. He wasn't really the type that was always there to give you a big hug. That was my mom. If I wanted to prove that I could do something, it was through my dad. I live, breathe being a ranger medic. I was in the barracks. I'd stitch people up at night after bar fights. I'd do whatever I needed to do to take care of my guys because at the end of the day, when we were overseas, mommy's not there, nobody's there, they come to dock. And that for a long time, that was me. I believe it was the third night a vehicle had stopped at one of our checkpoints. out of the vehicle and asked for her for water. I don't think, I don't think I'll ever get over the fact that, you know, they killed, you know, three of our guys using a pregnant woman. That was a, you know, a real kick in the balls when it came to morale. But this is when I realized, like, you know, guys can get hurt, guys can get killed. This is for keeps, you know, like this isn't, this isn't a training mission, this is war. Things dramatically changed. Uh, you know, we kind of had to, had to prepare for a whole new battle. Northwest of Baghdad, near the Haditha Dam. An apparent suicide bombing attack by a pregnant woman at a checkpoint leaves at least three US service members dead. We just lost guys supporting our mission. It solidified all of our resolve to stay there and to win. Day four, we start taking insane incoming fire. Some of these 155 rounds would hit at the front of the hill that I was hiding on, and you could feel the force move through the mountain and move through your body. They would rain hot shrapnel down upon us. I didn't know that shrapnel would be hot. A piece piece rang up from one of the rounds and kind of clink clinked down the hill and stuck on this uh, saw gunner's neck. And, um, you know, he had to grab a, a Leatherman tool to peel it off of his neck. And to be that close, to have that tangible experience of shrap metal. And you saw that, no, you know, life really is very fragile. And you could easily be one of these people that the shrap metal is cutting through. After two, three days of indirect fire over and over and over, 200 rounds a day, it was just it was taxing on everybody. I'd been in the same pair of socks the whole time. So my feet were kind of slipping off a little bit, like started losing the skin on them. It was very disgusting. We we're in desert mop suits. We have these chemical suits on that don't provide the same level of ventilation as normal clothes do. So 
already, you know, we're sweating more than we normally would. We had to ration water pretty closely. You know, we were pretty much out of food by that point. Rangers are known for being able to operate without food, um, without sleep. But you need water. You know, everybody needs water. The toughest guy in the world needs water. Everybody got used to eating a little bit of food. Everybody uh, got used to running out of uh, chewing tobacco. Tobacco is a big deal. You know, I remember running across the dam to get a dip of Copenhagen when, you know, fully knowing that I could die for that. But, you know, that's just kind of one of those things, you know, you, you learn, you get accustomed to certain things, you know. This is where I met this kid, uh, Matt Sanders, who fortuitously brought a carton of Marlboro Reds. Specialist Taylor found out that I had a carton of cigarettes. And, you know, he'd run out of Copenhagen. And so, you know, every, you know, hour or two, he'd come up and, you know, ask me for a cigarette. Here I am, this cherry private, and like this tabbed, tab spec four, you know, sniper, you know, who was like a god to me, was like asking for me for cigarettes. So I was like, dude, just happier than I could possibly be just to give him cigarettes. You know, of course, he was probably a little bit nicer than, to me than he probably would have been in any other circumstances because I had those cigarettes. After four or five days, you know, your, your brain starts not being able to process. Your body doesn't process the stress very well. Everybody's getting really tired. And I'd have to get them away from the battle for a little bit. Okay, you get 30 minutes to break, and I'll warm you up some meal. I'll heat you up at MRE like mommy used to, I guess. And, and we'd have to nurture each other back to strength. Things that nobody thinks about are the practicalities of war. What happens to a city that gets abandoned? There'd be these packs of like Labradors and house pets roaming around, kind of wandering. Their owners had abandoned them and they kind of wandered the plains wondering what to do. And over that week, they became wild. They became feral and they formed packs. They fought one another. And eventually, um, I watched as they would eat the dead. In haunting ways. For these sorts of brave enemy soldiers that we fought, to see them go out that way, that really bothered me. It felt almost overwhelming at that point because the fire got so accurate. One of our rangers looked to peek over his position and uh, at that point was hit by the large piece of shrapnel. Immediately the, the call for medic came. As we were running, you know, I remember rounds continuing to come in. We'd run, you know, we'd hear the round come in, we'd have to hit the dirt. And we'd get back up, start running again. They had him leaning up against the wall. You know, I'd never, I, I, I'd, I'd kind of be expecting something manageable. You know, I'd, I, 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 I wasn't expect, expecting, you know, penetrating head trauma. You know, I felt like I froze. All of a sudden, it was. It, the, the reality, you know, was, was, I was scared, you know, like it was the worst thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. aren't saying, you know, you, you guys got this. I mean, it probably wasn't but five or 10 seconds, you know, if that, that I was frozen. It felt like an eternity. You know, I never wanted to work on one of my buddies, you know. A guy named 
Jeremy Felbush. I knew him all right, you know, I knew him pretty well, I think. We partied together a couple times. He was a mortarman. And, um, you know, like I said, those rounds are effective. And uh, we got him right in the forehead. He just immediately went to work. Felbush was unresponsive and he, he wasn't breathing. But he had a very strong radial pulse in his wrist. And, and that indicated to me that, you know, he, he was very much still alive. I listened for breathing and I could hear gurgling, um, which indicated to me that he had an obstructed airway. And so the platoon medic was prepared to do a tracheotomy. Nobody wants to do uh, that kind of procedure, you know, in such an unsterile and chaotic environment. Luckily, we didn't need to do that. I stuck the suction in his mouth. It was, you know, essentially dry blood and, and flesh in the back of his throat. And when I was able to clear that, that, that blood and flesh out of his throat, you know, he was able to, to resume breathing on his own. And so we start to load him up, and Jeremy's a big boy. I had him at the shoulders, and a couple of other guys had him at the legs and the hips, and they'd passed him to other guys on the other side of the wall. Things are happening so quickly, and they pulled him from, from my grasp. I think everyone was at that point, you know, in fear for Jeremy's life. And, you know, the artillery is still coming in. When we really started taking heavy artillery rounds, it, it was like Volkswagen bugs crashing in front of you. It sounds like if you, if you went to an airport and you listened to these 747s land, Sometimes the acoustics will resonate in a weird way where you're just like, you kind of sound. And that's what these carry. It's just huge. We drove to the center of the dam. I had his head sitting in my lap. I didn't want his head to touch the ground again. It was this, this like, you know, almost fear of mine. So I, you know, put his head in my lap. So I had to wait for someone to, you know, replace me. They brought him in the back of a, a Humvee that they had converted into a makeshift litter, and they brought him to the center of the control point. It was a lot to take in. And I just remember that look when Matt looked at me, you know, and he was, you know, his mop suit was covered in blood, and, uh, you know, I just remember him handing him over and saying, you know, I know that you guys will do what needs to happen, you know. In the Ranger Regiment, there's this sense that the medics can save just about anybody. If you're still alive and ticking when you get to us, we'll take care of you. And we'll do whatever we need to do, whether it be fly a plane, fly a bird down to come pick you up. We'll make sure that you're treated right, whether dead or alive. And that's something that we all live by. And so, um, yeah, we, we worked on Felbush, and um, it, it looked bleak. At this point, you know, I was, you know, God, covered in blood. You know, I'd never, you know, I, I don't think I'd ever seen so much blood, you know, especially on me before in my life. And I, I, I didn't have a choice. I, I couldn't take off my clothes and put on new clothes, you know. And at the same time, though, I, I really didn't want to. You know, it comes a point where you gotta wash your hands, you know, and it's like, I didn't wanna wash my hands. You know, I didn't wanna like, rent, you know, it felt wrong to wanna wash my hands. Like, I just didn't, like, I, like, I just didn't wanna like, I just didn't wanna rinse him off me. I felt like I, it'd be like a, like a disservice to him. I never really thought about why I didn't want to wash it off. I just know that, you know, the times that it's happened, I just, it's the hardest thing in the world to do is to, 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 to wash your hands of your buddy's blood. Like, it's, it's not easy.
One of the reasons why we were at the dam was because we were afraid of the city getting flooded. The city getting flooded would mean that the conventional forces couldn't move on and uh, seize the rest of Iraq. And flooding the city would mean that all of these Republican Guard soldiers would lose their homes. I had heard later that um, Saddam had told this unit in particular that if the Americans seized this dam, they would blow it and you would lose your homes. And so both sides were fighting to make sure that city didn't get flooded. We were fighting for the same cause, maybe. Um, either way, there's a you know deep sense of irony that they were fighting so hard to save their homes and we were fighting them so hard to save their homes. We get word over the radio that there is like a convoy of Iraqi tanks moving our direction. That word quickly spread throughout the platoon that, you know, hey, we got tanks, you know, moving on our position. We were all pretty tired by this point, and it wasn't a morale killer, but it was also very, very sobering and very, you know, it's almost like, okay, I guess here we go, you know, I guess we're gonna do this now. We were preparing for the worst, to say the least. At some point, uh, an airstrike was called in and, you know, quickly, you know, neutralized that, that as a threat. It kind of had calmed down um, a little bit, like towards like day five or something like that. I mean, when I say calm down, we weren't getting 200 rounds each day. We were getting, you know, sporadic things blowing up around us. I believe it was day six when uh, the conventional army finally does come. And you see these big Abrams tanks rolling down this highway, and guys are actually cheering. I just remember all these tanks come rolling through here, right? And you start realizing, well, nobody's made it to Baghdad yet. I didn't know they were coming, but somebody knew enough to make a sign that said, happy motoring this dam, secured by 3rd Ranger Battalion. You know, we have this big kind of congratulatory moment, and then we, we go over the dam, and some Blackhawks are coming to relieve us, and it really, it really was, once again, the cinematic moment of sitting on the edge of a Black Hawk as it pans off and you see this, like, wild carnage everywhere. You almost hear that sentimental violin music in your head <laughs> as, you're, as you're taking off and just kind of trying to put yourself in perspective of something that you'd never be able to put in perspective. I was so exhausted by the time, you know, we got picked up. And the guys that I've been fighting alongside were even more tired than I was. At the same time, I think we were all pretty excited getting pulled off the dam. You know, we all knew, we all knew what we did was big and we all knew it was significant. At the end of that day, everybody was covered in blood. And we'd been out for six, seven days and this is the first moment where you feel safe again. We start talking, and we're like, you know what, let's all just be happy that we're alive. And, you know, it's, it's in those times that you see, like, how fleeting everything is in life, you know? And it's just kind of, it's in those times that you realize what matters and what doesn't. Haditha was actually my last mission that I ever did. My parents begged me to come home because they'd been waiting to see when they're, you know, someone's gonna knock at their door, maybe their son's not there. I felt like I owed it to them to go home. So now I'm like a lot of guys, and you know I'm on a journey to try to make sense and to find inner peace with all the things that have happened. I turned 20 uh, a week after we got back from Haditha Dam. That week in my life, I really feel like I changed as a person forever. For him to be one of the first guys there to, to save Phil Bush's life, be on his first combat mission ever. I mean, you can't rise to the occasion better than that. He did a good job treating Felbush. And, um, you know, Felbush is alive, and there's a lot to say for that. Felbush was able to recover and do quite successfully. Uh, he was the first spokesman for the Wounded Warrior Project. I don't think that I would have developed into, you know, the ranger that I did if it had not been for, you know, Doc Boomer's influence. In a sense, it was like a dad going, man, I helped that guy become what he is. You know, I was proud of him. I'm still proud of him. I'll always be proud of him. 
Haditha Dam very much was my coming of age. It, it taught me that courage is not being fearless, but courage is, is, is moving forward in, in spite of the fear. Fear is, is something that's overcomable. Our coalition special operations forces also seized the Haditha Dam. That has been seized as of two days ago, and we prevented its destruction. There have been significant regime losses in the vicinity of the dam. This Haditha Dam, if it had been blown, it would have been a significant problem causing flooding in the passageway where U.S. armor uh, intended to pass through. Uh, instead, that didn't happen.